Good morning and welcome to this service of choral matins here at Lincoln Cathedral on this first Sunday after Trinity. And you can follow the order service in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same, by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do, when we assemble and meet together, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice, unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O oh Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. 
from the book Deuteronomy. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone, and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all peoples, as it is today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart, and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, him alone you shall worship, to him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise, he is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt seventy persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in heaven. You shall love the Lord your God, therefore, and keep his charge, his decrees, his ordinances, and his commandments always. This is the word of the Lord. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us 
has come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, but without end. The second lesson is taken from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, verses 1 to 12. Paul sails for Rome. When it was decided that we were to sail for Italy, they transferred Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Embarking on a ship of Admiritium that was about to set sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to be cared for. Putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. After we had sailed across the sea that is off Sicilia and Pomphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship bound for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus, and as the wind was against us, we sailed under the lee of Crete, of Salmone. Sailing past it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia. Since much time had been lost, and sailing was now dangerous, because even the fast had already gone by, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I can see that the voyage will be with danger and much heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Since the harbour was not suitable for spending the winter, the majority was in favour of putting to sea from there 
on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, where they could spend the winter. It was a harbour of Crete, facing southwest and northwest. Here ends the second lesson. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy Show thy mercy upon us, and 
Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth, and so replenish her with thy grace of the Holy Spirit, that she may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue her plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant her in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen her that she may vanquish and overcome all her enemies. And finally, after this life, she may attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, and prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone workest great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, and that they may truly please thee, pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and has promised that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Yeah. 
I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When I was an archdeacon, I had to deal with matters of ecclesiastical law, disputes to deal with graveyard regulations or request to bend the faculty rules for planning for reordering of churches. And I remember being called in by a rather battle-worn priest to try and appease a very persistent parishioner who wanted to flout the regulations about memorial inscriptions on gravestones. I appealed to this parishioner and to her sense of natural law and reason, explaining that if I bent the rules for her, then my life would become impossible. Everyone else would expect me to do the same for them, and I would be permanently out negotiating deals and will get nothing else done. That's why we have the rules, I said. And to my surprise, she conceded, shrugged her shoulders and accepted my plea. Well, one objective of natural law is mutual flourishing and the common good. But it's fair to say that in the world of individualism, personal freedom and choice, rules and regulations are not popular. Fortunately, despite that, most of us are good citizens and adhere to them. It's why when others don't, we get so indignant, especially if we think they ought to know better or set a good example. When someone in the public office flouts the rules, plenty of people will start calling for resignations and naming and shaming them. And likewise, many good citizens who complied with all the costly lockdown rules seized a little recently with the sight of packed beaches over the bank holiday weekend. And one of the things we have been learning during this pandemic is our interdependence and the potential consequences of careless actions which have repercussions on the weakest and the most vulnerable, as well as those on the front line caring for them. There are human and civil laws in place to try and enforce reasonable actions. And then there are the moral obligations of natural law, which urges us to seek the common good, to, go to do good and not to do harm. As Christians, when it comes to rules, there's a further hierarchy of law. In Sunday school, I was taught it like this, love God, love your neighbour, love yourself. Eternal law comes above all else, governing everything. God's overarching plan set out in the divine law, revealed in scripture for our good and the good of all. Under that is natural law, which is to do with how we engage and participate in these higher laws and put them into practice in our life. We sometimes talk about a rule of life, the way we choose to live. And the reading from Deuteronomy this morning sums up this essence of the law. Love God, love your neighbour, love yourself. We're told to love and serve God with all our heart and soul and to demonstrate that love as good citizens of the kingdom, adhering to the commandments, the divine law set out in Holy Scripture. And we are to love our neighbour, in particular the stranger, the orphan and the widows. In other words, those most at the mercy of harm, the vulnerable the weak and the marginalised. Law orientates our life towards well-being, order and peace. But it's intended to be for the common good and benefit of all, not just for ourselves. What does the Lord our God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. We do this not just in keeping God's laws and in worship, but in faithful practice of these teachings through the love of our neighbour 
and the ordering of our lives as peacemakers and lovers of all that makes for the flourishing of our communities. To do good and not harm. May that be so. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>